I think the important point is that what we show with the use of RVD transplant and continuous lenalidomide maintenance is the best progression-free survival reported in this setting to date with the most mature data. What was very interesting, I think, also was that if you kept transplant in reserve and used it later, whilst clearly the progression-free survival was shorter by approximately 21 months median, Remarkably, there was no overall survival difference, which were identical with follow-up over six and a half years. And when we looked at the patients who'd had delayed transplant, only 28% of them actually had embarked upon autologous stem cell transplantation. And that was important because in our French partners, it was the opposite. 80% or so of the patients in the delayed transplant arm with a parallel study had engaged transplant with exactly the same outcome, identical survival. So clearly, transplant matters for controlling event-free survival and targets, in my view, the stemness of the disease. And there may be an important immune interaction that occurs with autologous reinfusion um, and, of course, lenalidomide maintenance. But I think the categoric sort of observation that there is no survival difference yet um, is very important to understand. And tolerability you touched on, no unexpected toxicities, that's for sure. But we clearly show not only a drop in quality of life, not only the expected toxicities of high-dose therapy, which will recover, but we had a much better handle from our study on second primary malignancies. And no difference overall, which was great, but we clearly saw a signal for AML-MDS, albeit rare, but nonetheless real. And that, of course, doesn't change. Uh, it's not static. That increases over time. So understanding that is going to be very important. But I do want to emphasize it's still rare. And that's, of course, very important. So where I'm left with this is, you know, Melphalan matters, but can we do better? And I think our data provide a foundation for that. Uh, and we already have evidence of that. We have, you know, the quadruplet therapies, the integration of monoclonal antibodies. We arguably may have ways of delivering uh, a melphalan-like drug less toxically, for example. You know, so there are opportunities. And then there are also other small molecules in addition um, to the monoclonal antibodies that could be very relevant, say, in 17P disease. And then Esther, what's I think so important to remember is we, of course, have the revolution of CAR-T therapy and bispecific T cell engages. You know, this is a new world of cellular therapy and a sort of derived strategies and recognizing that, you know, bispecifics aren't strictly cellular, but it's essentially, you know, an in vivo process by which the immune system is re-harnessed and, and targeted. So I think when you think of it like that, um, if we didn't have other options, it would be a very simple conversation. But we have multiple options and they're moving earlier. So I think uh, lots to look forward to, lots to study. And at the end of the day, um, a tailored approach to therapy for each patient, I think these data certainly support.